the reason that I even sit here or speak or care for that matter is because I spent a significant part of my life out in the deepest darkness. I was very deceived. I had been raised in religion, but I was very deceived. And when it came time for me to try to um, find God at the what would have been the end of my life, I was 26 years old and I was dying of the effects that my addictions had had on my life in every way. And the only reason I didn't commit suicide was because I had been told many times that if you did, you would go to hell. So that's the reason that I didn't, is because I was afraid of going to hell. And when I went to try to get help to find God, and I went to many sources, preachers in churches were what I chose, none of them were able to give me what I needed, which was hope that I could be saved. They all wanted me to get sober. They all wanted me to get help. They all wanted me to do something besides, I, I just honestly believe not one of them thought that I could come to salvation in the condition I was in. Then when I come to salvation, I find it very difficult to find people who will tell me the truth about what I'm reading in the Bible because I really wanted to know the truth. I did not want to end up back where I was, where I was terrified of hell, legitimately. So I read in the Bible what it says and then I ask someone about that and everyone mutes it, they neuter it they say, well, you know, it was back in this other culture. They try to somehow make it about something else besides what it clearly says. I have committed my life to speaking the truth for God. I believe what the Bible says. I have lived the blessing side and I have lived the cursing side. I know that it's true. And even though it's costing me relationships. I'm caring enough to speak the truth according to what the Bible says. There's really not much in it for me, but the fact that God has asked me to follow him and to do it in truth. And that's what I've chosen to do because I don't do anything. If I'm not all in like I was with the devil, if I'm not all in with Jesus, then I may as well hang this up because I'm an all in kind of person. And the only one that deserves my all in is Jesus Christ. So I'm going to continue to speak on an area that is very untouched by many. And it's a pretty big deal because it certainly has been in my life. I have been very guilty of this. I have ended friendships because certain people keep me tied to this kind of conduct. It's so easy for me to get involved in it that I have had to separate from certain people just because I, I need to not do it. And it's tempting. So I choose my company carefully and I want to warn everyone else what I know to be true about this subject. My last messages were on an evil heart, manipulation, bullying, all being the sin of witchcraft. People don't know that. They are shocked when they write me and are shocked that they were not, never told this. Witchcraft is a sin that clearly is not going to go to heaven unless it's turned from. These are really big subjects because they are heaven or hell subjects. They're not just... Um, hairstyle, clothing choices. These are character choices. And the Bible is clear, heaven or hell, based on whether you keep them or not. So I want to address another specific group of behaviors in this same area. And I will say that God never, not once, has caused a person to gossip or slander anyone. 
The only author of those things is the devil. So if it's happening and it's coming out of my mouth or someone else's mouth, one is in control and that is the devil. It would never be the Holy Spirit. This choice invites demons into your life and your family. It is closely connected to a spirit of malice, often the instigator, and I will tell you that that spirit is a significant devil to get rid of. Definitely not one you want, but when you walk around angry and judging and blaming and blaming me for what the Bible says, it's very likely there's a spirit of malice. And on Judgment Day, Matthew 12, 36 says, you will give account for every abuse, gossip, slander, evil speaking, and persecution. You will answer for every one of them unless you have repented and turned. For every gossip, slander, and evil you have spoken about or to others, you need to repent. I need to repent too. We all need to repent. And these are the things that shut off your life with God. They bring stagnation. You have no breakthrough. You're distant from God. Heaven is basically shut to you. And you will go to hell if you do not repent and flee from these choices. That's what the Bible says. Jesus cannot allow anyone to preach his gospel without love as their very first mandate. It has to be there. Satan will tell you that you can preach, serve, lead a ministry. And the thing is, he'll bring the emotions to back it up. So you'll do all of these things, feeling superior, feeling like you're a good Christian, feel like you're entitled to beat up the messenger. You'll feel all of those things are completely within your rights. He will give you that. Jesus won't, but the devil will. You can feel great about your faith while still gossiping, abusing others, slandering, speaking evil about others, and even wishing others would fail. Not every person preaching or serving in ministry is sent by Jesus. In fact, very few are. Satan sends his own into any ministry or any church for one purpose, to bring confusion, to water down the message, to corrupt the gospel, he doesn't want anything about holiness and purity and devotion to Jesus to stand out. He wants it to become about religion where people can live any which way and nobody's going to ch challenge it. It's just going to be allowed. And if those teaching are not demanding that God, what God demands, that we honor Jesus Christ with our life and that purity and holiness and love is demanded, you can be sure they're counterfeits. The evidence would be by their own fruit. Again, I said that before, look at the fruit. If they are not passionately bringing people to repentance and telling them to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, you cannot continue to live in sin. They're a counterfeit, according to the Bible. And the price will be hell for them in the end if they do not repent. And there is a much higher stake for those who are in roles where they're considered a leader. That's why it would be best for you if you're not living pure and in a right relationship with Jesus Christ and sharing him the way the Bible says to, that you step completely out of a role where people think you represent the truth about the Bible. We should all demand the truth. The Hebrew word translated gossip in the Old Testament is defined as one who reveals secrets, one who goes about as a tale bearer or a scandal monger. A gossiper is a person who has privileged information about people and goes on to reveal that information to those who have no business to know it. Gossip is different from sharing information in two ways. The intent Gossipers often have the goal of building themselves up by making others look bad and exalting themselves to others or even just to themselves. Jealousy drives a very large percentage of gossip. And second, the information, the type of information being shared. Gossipers speak of faults and failings of others or reveal potentially embarrassing or shameful things regarding the lives of others without their knowledge or approval. Even if they mean no harm, it is still gossip. The condemnation of gossip in the Bible is very harsh. 
In Romans 1, 28 through 30, it says gossip is one of the sins that points to the deepest depravity in man. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey parents. So we can see from that set of verses how serious the sin of gossip is and that it characterizes those who are actually under God's wrath. That's what he says. You cannot say you love God and yet do that kind of a verbal assault on the creation that means everything to him, that he sent his son to earth to die for. You cannot. You simply cannot love God and do that also. If you love him, you will love others. The book of Proverbs has a long list of verses that cover the dangers of gossip and the potential hurt that results from it. Proverbs 11, 12 through 13 says, a man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his tongue. A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse man stirs up dissension and a gossip separates close friends and many friendships have been ruined over what started with gossip and that actually just happened to me. It does ruin friendships. Those who gossip stir up trouble and they cause anger, bitterness and pain among friends and sadly many thrive in this and they look for opportunities to destroy others and then when they're confronted, they deny the allegations and answer with excuses and reasons why they are not wrong to have done what they did. Rather than admit the wrongdoing, which either, no matter how you slice it, it's gossip, they blame someone else or they attempt to minimize the seriousness of what the Bible calls wicked and equates to the sin of murder. Proverbs 18, seven through eight says, a fool's mouth is his undoing, and his lips are a snare to his soul. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost parts. Proverbs 21, 23 says, those who guard their tongues keep themselves from calamity. Gossip does not just apply to the one talking. It can also be very hard to overcome the temptation to listen when someone is sharing things about another. Listening to it is just as much a part of gossip as speaking it, according to Proverbs 17.4. It's fairly easy to identify gossip when the content is harsh and clearly intended to harm the image of another. But Colossians 3.8 and James 4.11 command us not to slander another. Subtle innuendos can be harder to discern as gossip, yet they still mislead someone's thoughts about a person unfairly and that's what makes them wickedness. And you need to ask yourself first, will this hurt the person that I'm talking about? James 4.17 says, leave no room for gray on that. So whatever, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And if you're unsure if saying something would be gossip or not, don't say it. Words are powerful and can't be unsaid. We should strive to keep gossip out of our lives and our interactions with others for everybody's benefit. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. And Jesus affirmed that on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they have spoken, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. That is what Jesus says. The words we speak will either build us up or they will tear us down. And there's multiple references to that. Luke 12, 3 says, What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. So our choice of words today 
will either bring blessings or curses upon ourselves from both God and man in present time and for eternity. Your entire eternity is being impacted by what you say today out your mouth. Our words have enormous power for good or evil. Tongues can kill, they can also save lives. A false witness can cause the death of an innocent man, according to Proverbs 25, 18. But a comforter can give hope to a suicidal person with an uplifting word, Proverbs 16, 24. A slanderer can destroy the reputation of a good person, Psalm 56, 2, 1 Corinthians 6, 10. Godly parents can teach their children the truth of God's word. Proverbs 22, 6, and that's kind of the, for people who have children, your children will go to heaven or hell in their early years. The chances are, if they have not been saved before they turn as an adult, there is a very slim chance they will be saved. They have to be reached before then. It is the parent's mandate from God to do that work. Don't allow them to be completely successful in sports, academics, anything else over making sure they are followers of Jesus Christ because in eternity, none of those things are going to matter either side. Set them on the path for life. A wise counselor can steer young through perils, vulnerabilities, according to 2 Timothy 2.22. But the tone of our words can be just as important as their meaning. Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And the general known rule states that 7% of meaning is communicated through the words spoken, 38% of the meaning is communicated through the tone of the voice. 55% of the meaning is communicated through the body language. This was developed by psychology professor Albert Morabian at the University of California in Los Angeles, who laid out the concept in his 1971 book, Silent Messages. Proverbs 10:11 says, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. The power of life and death is truly in the tongue. So you can look at the speech coming from anyone, anyone around you, and they are either a fountain of life or death is in their tongue. That determines the side they're serving. Choose life. In Christian circles, spreading rumors finds a vehicle with what's known as a prayer chain. Prayer chains are ways that Churches inform other members of prayer needs within that body, but they can also be useful for sharing information that probably should not be shared, that's private, that's personal, and destructive to individuals or the church. Be very careful to govern prayer chains appropriately. Proverbs 26.20 20 says, Without wood, a fire goes out. Without a gossip, a quarrel dies down. We can't stop all rumors, but we can refuse to participate in them. You respond by saying, would it be okay if I reached out to this person to share your concern? I guarantee you, in most cases, that will be a shocking thing for you to say to them. Paul lists gossip as one of the sins he fears that he will find in the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians 12.20 says, I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. If you don't feed into someone's control and manipulation, I guarantee you, you're going to see fits of rage. Gossip causes division within the church and it absolutely must be addressed. And that's why I'm addressing it is because the Bible demands that it's addressed. In Matthew 18, 15 through seven, Jesus explains how sin should be dealt with in the church. He says, 
If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector, which were despised people at that time. When a person gossips, they need to be confronted according to Jesus. Sometimes it can be difficult to recognize gossip. It may appear to be motivated by genuine concern because that's what they'll say. But simply respond, no, I haven't heard that and I don't want to hear it. You can add, you should not be repeating things that may or may not be true. If you have genuine concern for this person, you need to go to them personally and see if they need help. And then, if it was out of genuine concern, the concerned person will follow up with the person they were about to tell a story about, and if it was just gossip, they won't. If you're given a suspect prayer request, ask some questions. This is what Jesus wants. Did this person tell you this themselves? If not, then how do you know it's true? If yes, then did they tell you you can tell other people and that you can ask others to pray for them? Did they give you permission to share this information with others? Always challenge gossip. Refuse to engage and redirect the gossip to showing respect. And you can show respect to the gossiper too, just in these ways, asking questions and not going along with it. The person who hears the gossip has two options. They can let it go, or they can go to the source, the person being spoken of, and ask them what the facts are. That's the two choices of the person that hears gossip. There may be occasions when a person is genuinely concerned and goes to a pastor or a mature believer to get help about how to handle a situation, how to respond to something. This may likely not be gossip, but just be cautious. Gossip can lead to slander, which truthfully becomes disastrous to the person who is speaking it. The slanderer is the one that is impacted. Ecclesiastes 10, 12 through 14 says, the lips of the stupid one swallow him up. The start of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end afterward of his mouth is calamitous madness and the foolish one speaks many words. That's what the Bible says. Satan was the first known slanderer named in the Bible when he defamed God's name and his reputation, as well as his authority over man. And that is why Jesus taught his followers to pray for the glorification of God's name and the vindication of his sovereignty in his kingdom in Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Slander is to defame to injure by maliciously uttering a false report, to tarnish or impair the reputation of one by false tales maliciously or propagated. Psalm 101.5 says, whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. That's what God says. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure them. Matthew 12.36 says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Proverbs 10, 18, the one who conceals hatred has lying lips and whoever utters slander is a fool. 1 Peter 3, 16, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good character in Christ may be put to shame. James 4, 11 says, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Exodus 20, 16 says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, 
having the appearance of godliness yet denying its power avoid such people that's what god says first peter 2 1 says so put away all malice all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Titus 3.2 says to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. The causes of slandering are varied. One is because the person has an evil heart. Luke 6.45 says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. But an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So basically what you say shows what's in your heart. Another is because of hatred. People slander because they're hateful. Psalm 109, 2 through 5 says, For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Thus, they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for love. Another reason is because of idleness. 1 Timothy 5.13 says, And because they learn to be idle, wandering from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not to say. Another reason is the class of people who slander others, the Bible calls them wicked. Psalm 50, 16 to 20 says, But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? That's what someone does when they hear the truth and they refuse to heed it and they become angry with the person who shared it. It happens all the time everywhere. Someone's trying to offer much needed correction to someone to keep them from hell and deception that they're going to heaven, but they're not, and they get angry with the messenger. Verse 18 of that says, when you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak evil against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. Another class of people who slander are what the Bible refers to as hypocrites. Proverbs 11, 8 through 9 says, The righteous is delivered from trouble, trouble and it comes to the wicked instead. The hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. Another group are those who are under demonic powers of control. And they have come under the control of demonic powers also. Revelation 12, 9 through 10 says, So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Another group are those who are deceivers. Psalm 52, 2 through 7 says, Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully you love evil more than good, lying rather than speaking righteousness. You love all devouring words, your deceitful tongue. God will likewise destroy you forever. He will take you away and pluck you out from your dwelling place, uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, Here is the man who did not make God his strength but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Another group that do this are what the Bible calls foolish people. Proverbs 10, 18 through 21. Whoever hides hatred has lying lips. Whoever slant, spreads slander is a fool. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of wisdom. 
Results of slander are slander separates friends. Proverbs 16, 27 through 28. An ungodly man digs up evil and it is on his lips like burning fire. A perverse man sows strife and a whisperer separates the best of friends. Another slander causes deadly wounds. Proverbs 18, 6 through 8 says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles, and they go down into the inmost body. Slander also results in strife. Proverbs 26, 19 through 21 says, Is the man who deceives his neighbor and then says, I was only joking. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Slander results in discord among the brethren. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, and a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Five, slander results in anger. Proverbs 25, 23 says, the north wind brings forth rain and a backbiting tongue and angry countenance. Slander can also result in murder, Psalm 31, 13. For I hear the slander of many, fear is on every side. While they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take my life. The punishment for slandering is up to God, if you will leave it to him. People obviously can take your life over slander, it's happened a lot. But Psalm 101, 3 through 8 says, I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part of it. The perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. Whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put them to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate them. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. The one whose walk is blameless, blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. Revelation 21.8 says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their place in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Slander causes the one who is guilty of slandering to lose his eternal reward. That is mentioned over and over. Psalm 101.5 says, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. God said that. Romans 1.30 and 32, backbiters are worthy of death and so are people who approve others who practice it. That's pretty fierce. That's those around them who tolerate it. 1 Corinthians 5.11, revilers in a local church should be withdrawn from if they don't repent. If we have slandered others, we must repent. We must ask for forgiveness from those we have slandered to be forgiven. And do not encourage or cooperate with a slanderer. If they cannot properly defend their speech, we are told to rebuke them, according to Ephesians 5.11, and limit your association with people known to be persistent slanderers. Proverbs 20.19 says, He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, therefore do not associate with one who flatters with his lips or one who opens wide his lips. Because talebearers are also flatterers. They say sweet things to people's faces, but slander them behind their back. And if you see someone that does this, I was in the world a long time. 
and this is a way of life amongst the heathen. This is what happens. When a man wants to have sex with you, he starts to flatter you. When people want something from you, they start to flatter you. One of the most disillusioning things for me when I became a Christian was that those in the church did the same thing. And the more that I have been in ministry, I am shocked at how many do this. It is complete witchcraft. When someone starts to flatter me, I've said this before, I instantly know the devil is involved in the conversation. Something else is going on besides what I think is going on or what they think I think is going on. But the world taught a lot of us some things and flattery cannot be trusted. When you are having a conversation with someone and discussing something that is a yes or a no and suddenly the flattery comes, instantly you can discount whatever they're saying because the flattery would not be there if there weren't a reason. It's not needed and it's against God. If you see people who do this, don't associate with them. That's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 5.11, if a member of the church persists in reviling others, he should be withdrawn from. 1 Corinthians 15.33, whether or not the slanderer is a member of the church, remember evil company corrupts good habits. If people continue such conduct and will not quit, we should limit our association with them. And by avoiding them, you won't be influenced to act like they do. And that's exactly why I have to draw a line because it's so tempting. There's a solution for slandering in Colossians 3, 16 through 17. For such things, the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. In that which you also walked some time when you lived with them, but now you also are to put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out your mouth, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. That's expected with salvation. And that you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also should you. And above all of these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts so that you can be called one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in the word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So how should Christians respond to a slanderous attack? Be slow to speak. It's very tempting to defend yourself, to strike back at the slanderer. God has sent me many prophetic messages along the last few years on how to conduct myself under very specific circumstances and they all contain the words do not defend yourself the battle is with me i will protect you that is the consistent message you must be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to get anger 
angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness or justice that God desires. That's what he says. We must all learn to control and stop ourselves from responding in a way that will likely dishonor God. Then you become just like them. You are now all playing at the same street level, just brawling. Don't let anyone reduce you to their level in this conduct. Forgive your offender. Without releasing the offense to God and releasing forgiveness to the offender, there is no way that we're going to be able to handle the problem in a right mind. Our offenders are probably not going to ask for our forgiveness because they deliberately slandered to cause harm and it's likely they have no regret for what they did. The forgiveness that we release isn't actually for them, it's for us. And you don't want to become like them. So if you don't forgive, you will become like them. And God cannot bless you or use you. You can work in a ministry your whole life, but there will not be any significant fruit to your labor if you are one who does not repent. Remember that without forgiving those who offend us, we won't be forgiven ourselves. Matthew 6, 14 through 15 and Mark eleven twenty six. Also, face your slanderer the biblical way. Matthew 18, 15 through 7, 17 says, approach them personally to talk to them. This is the method from Jesus. You explain what they did, and if they don't listen and repent, we bring a witness or two the second time we approach the offender. If they don't listen even then, you go to the church leaders. If they still reject your efforts made for their, to get them to acknowledge and ask for forgiveness, then say goodbye. Sever ties. Don't trust them again until they are walking in repentance. It's foolish and sinful to respond in an unwise and ungodly manner. God gave us a clear way of dealing with this. Let God exact justice on your behalf because he will, and he'll do a lot more than you can. He knows what's true, and if we're innocent of the lies against us, then allow God to defend you. Romans 12, 21 says, Don't let evil conquer you but conquer evil by doing good. So the best thing that you can do when this is what's happening is stay about your mission. You have a calling from God to serve others, to bless others, to represent Jesus. Those who are slandering and gossiping aren't representing Jesus, so the few that aren't need to represent Jesus because the world is crashing right now in fear. Just keep going about the Father's business. Leave all that mess to Him. Curses can result from gossip and slander. Curses on a person's life. Sadly, what they don't realize is that in most cases, the curses fall back on them. They end up under the curse themselves. A curse is to call down evil upon others or to call for evil to rest on someone or it's an invitation of evil against someone's enemies. A curse does more harm to the person who utters it than to the intended victim because this is the impact it has. Their heart becomes more bitter, more cold, and more cruel. And the worst part is they don't even know it. They're so disconnected from the heart of Jesus, they don't even know it. It doesn't even cross their mind. That's the worst consequence. They feel totally fine. They feel fine with Jesus. They're having some kind of feelings about that, which come from the enemy, but they do not think that they are in sin. That is the greatest deception of all. And the desire to harm others, not a healthy state of mind, is eventually going to come back on top of them. A curse can't go any further, really, than the person who utters it. To curse another means to expect darkness to impact them, which means that you're operating in witchcraft. You certainly aren't operating with the Holy Spirit. And I talked about that in my last two messages. That's just, there's nothing about it that isn't witchcraft. Cursing can also mean the expression of great disdain or loathing others. You should never curse anyone just because they 
did harm or disagree with you. James 3, 9 through 10 says, sometimes it praises our Lord and Father and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. That's James. And Jesus knew this, and he warned his disciples that they would experience the same persecution that he did. Proverbs 26, 2 promises us, like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse will not land on its intended victim. The 91st Psalm assures us that God is always protecting us from every form of evil and if we put our full trust in him. This isn't you taking half the battle and leaving the rest to him. Leave it all to him. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High, according to Psalm 91, will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrows that fly by day. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He will cover you with his feathers, shelter you with his wings, he makes many promises to those who are depending on him. And I can honestly say, I am living in a real faith walk. And I know when the words are suddenly real, which they didn't used to be, I know how protected I am by God. I have so many examples I, I don't know how I would continue if I didn't know the way that I know. I am amazed at how close God will come to his. Chapter 6 of Ephesians verses 11 through 18 also guarantees protection. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. When you trust in God and put on his armor, you can be assured that you are safe in God's care and no one can put a curse on you. The Bible has a lot to say about cursing, even in words and profanity. Christians are to be set apart and not using their mouths to curse in any way. We're not to imitate the world and the way the people of the world communicate. We must be careful not to even think curses towards others. And again, if people cannot tell that you are carrying around, that you are a container for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit points to Jesus with everything he does. I, I beg people to get right with God before you have no time left to do it. I had a situation a couple weeks ago and someone um, that I was I was talking with a close friend and her husband came, he was like fixing something in the house and he came up and he sat down and he said, I have a word for you. I didn't even know him. And he said, you are at war with, and he, he described a spiritual thing that made complete sense to me. And I said, I actually feel like I'm at war with a person 
It was someone that I had been close to for many years. And I said, so to me, it feels like I'm at war with a person. And he said, no, you're at war with a principality. And I said, it's hard for me to see that because when someone knows you as well as this person knows me, and then now does and says the things that they say, it's really hard for me to think it's a principality when they know fully what they're saying and doing. And he said, it's a principality that has completely convinced them in their mind that it's you, not them. They are fully, fully believing that you are the issue, not them. That's why it's with a principality. And I was really happy I heard that because that helped me a lot to sort this out a different way and to look at it a different way. And I was able to um, have a lot more successful experience with feeling I could walk in forgiveness. And it just really helped me to, to have that shared with me. I will say that swearing around people sins against them. You are sinning against anyone that you are using swearing and profanity around. The ones that I feel most bad for are children growing up under constant cursing because it curses them. The words you use bless them or curse them. So if children are growing up under constant cursing, constant negativity, constant words of death, that's what they're made of. Their little personalities are gonna be filled with dread, with fear. They're gonna have a really hard life because of the, they believe you. They believe everything you say. It doesn't matter if it's intended for someone or not. Cursing is sinful. People are not created to be trash cans. This violates sacred space that you have no right to invade in another's life. Cursing reveals a wicked heart. A true Christian will bear the fruits of repentance. They won't continue to use their tongue for evil. And if they do, they expose themselves as truly not being of the faith. They are an imposter because a person with genuine saving faith in Jesus Christ honors him with their mouth. Jesus deserves honor. And if you aren't giving it, you're not connected right because you would not walk up to your pastor and start using all kinds of profanity as you're talking to him. You have respect for your pastor. Jesus, you say, is living in you, but you can utter all this stuff out your mouth. You are not, he's not in there. If you can treat your pastor with more dignity than Jesus, you don't know him. And you need to get that fixed because Jesus is far greater than your pastor. He is also your final judge. He bore our sins on his body through him. And because of him, we have forgiveness available to us we do not have to go to hell where we deserve to be. Repentance is a result of our faith in Jesus Christ, and we must allow our speech to reflect the great price that was paid for us on the cross to stop using our bodies and our mouths as playgrounds for evil. George Washington said, the foolish and wicked practice of profane cursing and swearing is a vice so mean and low that every person of sense and character detests and despises it. The words you speak become the house you live in. John MacArthur says the tongue is you in a unique way. The tongue is you. It is the tattletale on the heart and discloses the real person. Not only that, but misuse of the tongue is perhaps the easiest way to sin. There are some sins that an individual may not be able to commit simply because he does not have the opportunity. But there are no limits to what one can say, no built-in restraints, no boundaries. In scripture, the tongue is variously described as wicked, blasphemous, foolish, boasting, complaining, cursing, contentious, sensual, and vile. And that list is not even exhaustive. No wonder God put the tongue in a cage behind the teeth, walled in by the mouth. 
God does not hesitate to go into battle to protect us and to protect our loved ones if we need him to do that. But let him decide how he will go to battle on our behalf. Do not ask him to take revenge on your enemies. Let him decide how he will fight each battle and what kind of judgment he will use. Ultimately, he would like to bring that person to repentance. And if you look at it, how guilty we are, we do not want to start issuing revenge and demands on this because we also are very guilty. We have done this to others. This is God's responsibility to sort out, not ours. Romans 12, 14 says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And Jesus asks us to love them, bless them, pray for them, and do good to those who hate you. I promise you, you'll be a lot healthier if you do. Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that they may be sons of your Father in heaven, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Therefore, you should be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 44 through 48. Also, he says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask for them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. But if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those who, from whom you hope to get back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners and expect to receive it back. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. Your reward will be great. You will be sons of the highest. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. Luke 6, 27 to 36. And he tells us that vengeance in this life belongs to the Lord and not to any one of us. Romans 12, 17 to 21 says, Repay no one evil for evil. Live peaceably among all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Nahum 1, 2 through 3 says, God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. When everything is all said and done, God is going to be righting all wrongs that were ever done to us in this life. And that is why we can let go and give it to God because it's his job to take care of our enemies. We can ask God to fight our battles when being unjustly attacked by others, but we have to let him decide what strategy he's gonna use and what kind of corrective action he's going to take in our battle. The only person who will be doing any kind of cursing in this life when it's appropriate will be God himself. God can curse someone if he wants to. Genesis 12, one through three says, now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you and you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God will judge everyone for every bad thing they've ever done unless it is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ before they die and cross over into judgment. We can let everything go into his hands and know that it's going to be resolved here or there. Ultimately, we hope that they will surrender to Jesus, repent, and peace will be made this side of heaven. This life is too short to stay stuck in hurts of our past. Second Peter 
1, 5 through 8 says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Christians, it is not an option that we can just stay in the state we're in. We are expected to grow spiritually. Our knowledge of God should be ever increasing and our obedience to him should be continually perfected. The Christian life is not about improving. It's not about getting back to the best version of yourself. It's about dying to yourself, being unoffendable, not self-improvement or works-based improvement, but new in Christ. In Christ, we are new creations and we are being made new. The Bible is very clear about that. We've been declared righteous and are becoming righteous. If that's not happening, you are not attached to the Savior. We're called to cooperate with God's work in us and we should be intentional about seeking to know him and obey him. He says we build each other up. We do not get to tear each other down. We should seek to live at peace with others. We should guard our thoughts, set our minds on things of God. Above all, we seek God and submit to his work in us. To protect yourself, pray for God to encircle you with a spiritual hedge. He did this for Job. Satan pointed this out to God, that he did this for Job. That Job 1.10 says, Have you not made a hedge about him and about his house? and about all that he has on every side. You've blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Ask for one of those hedges. Next, try to keep your life righteous and holy so that no door is open to give opportunity to anyone to curse or harm you in any way. Do not open doors to the devil. If something is attacking you in your life, examine on all fronts and try to find out where it's getting in. Um, Feel free to reach out. If that's the case, we, we would be happy to help. Cover yourself with Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 by putting on the full armor of God. And when you think of people who have hurt you, pray that they be blessed and that they prosper. Jesus instructed us in Luke 6, 28 to bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. So I guarantee you the devil will not be happy if he keeps bringing torment to your mind from what someone did and you just continue to bless them bless them bless them he's going to get real tired of bringing that up jesus said in matthew 5 22 but i tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister is subject to judgment again anyone who says to a brother or sister raka is answerable to the court and anyone who says you fool is in danger of the fire of hell remember that sin has placed the entire world under a under a curse and all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory according to Romans 3.23. The payment for our sin is death. And fortunately, when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, Jesus died in our place on the cross. He took the curse of death for us and the curse against us is now no longer. It does not rest on us anymore. We have to carefully examine our motives what the mouth speaks exposes the heart. So to correct our speech, we have to correct our hearts. That's why we have to be growing with the work that God's doing in all of us. We have learned that slander is often caused by sinful motives. So before we speak, we must carefully examine our hearts to be sure we speak from proper and holy motives. Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine 39 says, love your neighbor as yourself. If we can stop being concerned for only ourselves, we can learn to be concerned for all others involved. And Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. The goal is always to build others up and to help them to be right according to God's word. And that's the whole point of me sharing this, is because so little is said about this, and people feel justified in this what God says is a, a sin that will result in hell. You can call yourself whatever you want, but born again does not slander and um, have a lifestyle of gossip. 
There are definitely times when the sins and problems of others should be discussed. Sinners must be rebuked and other people who may be involved should be warned. But we should be warning those when the Bible is so clear about certain behaviors as this, that they are a heaven or hell choice. It is not loving to not warn people. All should be done like Jesus and his apostles did it. We must speak from a genuine concern for the welfare of others, not out of jealousy, pride, or vengeance. In the comments, I'm going to put a link for my favorite prayer book. It actually has so many, and it, it opens up to the PDF of the entire prayer book for whatever it is that you are wanting to deal with. It will probably have something in it that aligns very closely with the word of God. And when you pray the word, you're agreeing with God and it's a yes, it's a promise. So I'm going to have a prayer book inserted in the comments along with my sources. Precious Lord, please forgive me for all of my sin, especially with my mouth. I, this is such a challenging area and I am not one who can lord over others in any claims. I ask you to forgive me, wash me in your precious blood and cleanse me from all sin. And I do ask that you bless those who have hurt me. Bless them. I want them saved. I want them in heaven. I ask that you help this to land the right way with those who especially need to hear it, that you will make it land the right way so that they can hear it because it doesn't matter what I think, but it does matter what you think. I only want to be used by you. I ask that you help me and everyone else to honor you with our mouths, to make that a top priority that we correct our hearts, that corrects our mouths, that we honor you, the honor that you are due, and that we see others as priceless creation that you want us to see them as. Holy Spirit, I ask that you Bring healing to us in ways that we won't be able to find that are necessary. I ask that you show up in this area. We are in desperate need of you. We want to see revival. Please come. And I ask that you would help us in the days going forward as it's going to get darker and harder. Help us to be that bright light on a hill that you have called us to be but you have also given us the great privilege to be ambassadors for the king of kings we deserve nothing from you but hell help us to walk every day pinching ourselves that we have been chosen by the king i love you jesus i give you everything in jesus name amen